Two weeks ago today, I drove down to Margaret River and did a tasting at Xanadu Wines with winemakers Glenn Goodall and Brendan Carr, and they opened 77 bottles across Chardonnay and Cabernet for us to look at. We looked at the Black Label, Stevens Road and Reserve wines, and what it showed was really not just clear house style um, across both the Cabernets and the Chardonnays, but the longevity of wines from Margaret River. And that was really what we were trying to get into is how these wines age and how they evolve over time. The following day, Glenn and I shot an interview um, back at the winery. It's a really great interview and we go into depth um, on our favourite wines from the tasting the day before. So do check it out because the, um, the, our highlights ended up being very similar. A note to you though, I have no voice. It's awful. It's croaky. I woke up that morning with absolutely no voice at all. So what you see in the video is a huge improvement on what I had when I woke up that morning. So, um, you know, the show must go on. We're in town. We're there. We had to film. Sorry about it. I hope that you can put it to one side and enjoy the conversation about the great wines that we tasted the day prior. I'm here today at Xanadu Winery in Margaret River with Chief Winemaker Glenn Goodall. And I came down here yesterday to do this most epic of vertical tastings. We did 77 wines from Chardonnay and Cabernet across the Black Label Stevens and Reserve ranges, yeah. <clears throat> going back to 2007 or 2008, yep. depending on what was, what was um, relevant at the time. And so here we've chosen, we've each chosen three wines to talk about today, although we could have, I could have chosen 10 or 15. Yeah, it's like picking your favourite child. Yeah, um, it, was an, it was a staggering tasting that really, <clears throat> for me, solidified the ageability and the um, consistent style that the guys are doing here at Xanadu. Um, and so before we get into the vintages and what makes these wines so epic, can you tell us a little bit about the Stevens Road Vineyard and their mm -hmm. full range versus the Reserve range? Yeah, sure. Well, Stevens Road Vineyard... Um, is about two kilometres south of the winery. So it's, funnily enough, it's on a road called Stevens Road. So those of you who know Margaret River, it's the same road where Lewin and Voyager Estate are. It's the Golden Mile, basically. The Golden Mile, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic <clears throat> resource for us. We've owned it um, since 2008. Uh, it's 21 hectares, um, and of which nine of hectares of that is, is Chardonnay. So uh, when you get to the Stevens Road Chardonnay, it's, it's within those blocks. It's actually not just a block or a vineyard selection and it's a row selection so the bottom 20 rows of block two uh, yeah they're, they're just unique and, and that's what's always sort of made the uh the stevens road chardonnay just drilling down on that um yeah right on the budget up brook uh in, in the Wallcliffe subregion and close to the beach how far oh i say five k's from the ocean cool. certainly you can you know when you're in the vineyard in the morning and it's and the wind's blowing the right direction you can you can easily hear the surf um so yeah it's not far at all um and yeah the stevens road is it's our little you know slice of heaven our little grand cru vineyard that that dna and that, that of that vineyard is so unique that we began bottling um the wine under a stevens road label in 2009 for both the chardonnay which is the bottom 20 rows of block two and the cabernet which is a postage postage stamp size vineyard it's only 0.6 of a hectare so it's only 21 rows on that vineyard um so that's very much about site and very much about um the the dna of that vineyard the reserve has always been about making the best wine that we can in any given vintage, provided the vintage allows us to produce a reserve wine. So we're not wedded to any one vineyard. Uh, in fact, with the Cabernets, it's, it's generally been, you know, perennial favourites of our growers that have been long-term growers for Xanadu for 15 years. Um, but funnily enough, the, the reserve Chardonnay has always been a single vineyard, um, and that's always selected blind, and that's the Lagan Estate. So that's our own, uh, our oldest Chardonnay vineyard, which is just behind the winery, um, planted in 1981. So... Both of those Chardonnay vineyards, the Stevens Road and the and the, um, the Lagan Estate, are you know exclusively ginger inclined Chardonnay, and that's a big hallmark of, of the ageability of these wines. They're, um, I mean, they were incredible yesterday because <clears throat> the Steve, in terms of tasting this, the difference in taste between the two ranges, um, the Stevens Road were like minerally quartzy, salty, mm. fine, quite pure, um, and age in a very different way to the. Um, to the reserve, the re reserve is like coiled power. It's got density of flavour. These wines are, these are, I mean, <clears throat> I said of the 2015 
reserve Chardonnay when it was released, um, that it could easily <coughs> kick it alongside Grand Cru, White Burgundy and looking at it again yesterday and again today. Um, I'm so thrilled that I said that at the time and that the wine has not let me down <laughs> yeah. because it is looking so much better now than it did um, on release. And so it was, a, it was bloody awesome to try them. So let's, um, let's talk about what we've got in the Chardonnays and then we'll move on to the Cabernets. So in the first glass, we've got the 2013 Stevens Road Chardonnay. And the reason why I chose this was because the Stevens Road and um, actually, it was in the Chardonnay and Cabernet too. 13 was a very consistent vintage mm. across the four, well, across the black label too, um, because it showed a really lovely minerality and a finesse um, that I really enjoyed. And can you tell us a little bit about 13 and what that might have been, that finesse might have been attributed to? Yeah, 13 was part of the purple patch of great seasons from pretty hard to split 2007 to 2014. Um, and I think, uh, you know, with, with moderate crops, uh, the ginger clone got that lovely sort of uh, tangy acid and, and that sort of, um, it was picked, it was, we had to pick the whites, you know, pretty quick at the start of the season of, of 2013. And then it we had a little cool, cool period, and, which was lovely for the, to allow the reds that sort of elongated sort of lengthened ripening period. Um, but yeah, you do see this, lo saw a lovely theme between the 13s and, and particularly when we looked at the 13 Stevens Road the, uh, interestingly enough, the 13 Reserve and the 13 Black Label, they're both actually from Lagan Estate. Ah. So it's the uh, fish that John West rejected didn't make the Reserve, but it's actually the same block uh, that uh, exclusively made the Black Label in 2013. And they ah. both had that really, you can see in the colour, there was so, um, just h holding this brightness and this youthfulness, which was quite yeah, amazing. They were white. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. Um, um, why did you use Lagan in 13 for the um, Black Label? Just because we, um, we had quite a, we, quite a small make in 2013, or we only required to make a small amount. And it was like, well, we've, we've already selected our best barrels for the reserve. And if we're only making that much, we might as well make the rest of it out of this. And in any given year, a black label Chardonnay in particular is all estate grown, but not every year. Sometimes people call it our estate wine. That's true in some years, but really it's better to, you know, just I refer to it today as the black label or the premium. Um, it's worth noting as well that on release, the Black Label Chardonnay would have been around $27, making it blinding value for money if you're looking to age these wines. Um, so when I'm talking about your style of Chardonnay, mm -hmm. um, the wines can be, certainly the whites, um, well, the Chardonnays, can be um, austere on release because these guys block Malo mm -hmm. assiduously. Um, and <clears throat> the Jinjin clone, while it's responsible for really powerful, voluminously fruited wines, um, also has really... Uh, high acid and really great phenolics, like the, the tannic white wines, which is probably why I like them. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so I always say, if you're buying Xanadu Chardonnay, don't drink it before five years. You can, no worries, but you'll miss out on the complexity and the evolution of the wine. And they really open into this amazing space at about five years. And yesterday, those wines totally proved that theory right. Yeah, no, it was amazing to see how, how bright they were. And um, you know, I tend to be a sucker and like always sort of gravitate towards the younger wines and I'll probably tend to think more about the next wine that's being made rather than reflecting on wines that um, have been made in the past. So, yeah, it was a rare treat to go back and have a look at these wines um, um, for us as well. Um, moving into the second and third Chardonnays, we've got the 2015 Stevens Road and the 2015 Reserve Chardonnays. We both, when we were talking this morning about what we'd put on video today, we uh, basically had the same wines and had to try and work out how we're going to split them out. The 15 Chardonnays were incredible. Mm. They were just across the board, totally banging. And Breno thought so, JJ thought so, you thought so, and I thought so. These mm. wines are just exceptional. And right now, I mean, we talk about drinking windows and when do I drink my wine? Well, how long's a piece of string? There's no right answer because it absolutely depends on your mouth and how you like to drink them. For me, when it comes to Chardonnay, I accept that you can drink old Chardonnay, no worries. But I love it when they have that beautiful primary fruit, that core. And when they're kind of teetering on the precipice of primaries, you get all of that gorgeous fruit, but tertiary, you get all the complexity. And that's when you start to see things like, depending on the maker, of course, saffron, turmeric, you get mm. curry leaves. There's all of these really exciting spices and it just offsets the fruit. And that, for me, that brink, that's when I want to drink them. And the window was quite big yesterday. Mm. What did we say, like 12 to? 
Oh, 12, 18. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> there, um, yeah, it was extraordinary to see how fresh some of these wines were. And 15, it's almost counterintuitive because 15 was at, uh, actually a, uh, quite a warm and certainly a very, very early vintage. It was quite nerve wracking to think that, you know, this far south of Margaret River we're picking at the end of January, which is really, really unusual for us. When do you normally pick? Usually sort of mid-Feb and, you know, uh, 20 years ago, we were probably picking late Feb, early March. But obviously, those the styles have, have tightened up a lot since then, and, and obviously, you know, we're in a warming, drier climate as well. But um, yeah, really, really low yields, uh, and that's probably what brought on um, the maturity of these vines a lot earlier. Tiny yields, not so much with the fruitfulness, but just the fruit set was poor. So the the hen and chicken, the sort of uh, the peppercorn and pea-sized berries that you get on the on that sort of clone of Chardonnay, they were like little corn cobs or lots of yeah, little pe peppercorns. Oh, the bunch, yeah. like a little hand grenade. Like you yeah, just imagine right. a little hand grenade, that's, that's about it. <laughs> um, but great intensity, um, no marry blossom that year. So it was, there was, it was birds of Alfred Hitchcock proportion. So the vineyard team did a great job keeping the birds out. Um, that's actually really key. That's really central to, um, I would say, anxiety levels and fruit quality mm. during harvest because Margaret River um, has got these gorgeous marry trees and some years the trees are dripping in mm. flowers, right? Yeah. And on those years, the birds are really happy because they eat the flowers and not the grapes. So whenever we talk about it being an, a, an abundant marry blossom, the 18 was abundant. Um, that was a mega blossom. That was amazing. Yeah. That year. Yeah. yeah, so the birds are happy and the and people in the vineyards are happy too because the fruit aren't in there and pecking and causing trouble. Mm. So, um, yeah, 15 bloody hell. <laughs> yeah, oh, it made itself, these wines. like, And you still you see that sort of that dichotomy of style between the two, like the wines are made essentially the same, like hand-picked, whole bunch pressed, wild ferment, be judicious with your oak selection, um, and uh, yeah, just hope for the best. And, and <laughs> usually that wild fermentation just ex accentuates the personality of the vineyards. Mm. So that's hopefully what's coming forward is that the loudest voice in the glass here is the vineyard, not necessarily the winemaking or the um, or other secondary sort of elements. Um, and the, the hallmarks of the Stevens Road, it's got that oyster, as you said, that's always got this lovely minerally oyster shell, quite saline, salty margarita, um, uh, sea spray kind of characteristic about it. Uh, whereas Lagan, uh, the, sorry, the reserve or Lagan Estate, it's always got this sort of pear puree, limey sort of element. With a bit of time here, it's got this sort of flint, but it's, you can just see that it's just that latent power just uncoiling and it's, yeah, both of them with a really lovely acid drive and that phenolic backbone, which is, you know, a hallmark of ginger and chardonnay, and which is what, you know, paramount to me, is what helps them to age so well. Um, when um, <clears throat> a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago or more, I was reading a tasting note from Alan Meadows, who of course is the writer for Burghound, and he's a brilliant authority on, 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 um, on Burgundy. And um, in particular, one of his notes on um, a very good quality white Burgundy wine talked about it being palate staining in its intensity and I find um, and I often reference this in my tasting notes on your current release wines they're almost achingly intense they pierce the palate um, but the 15 now I mean I, I find wine kind of heartbreaking sometimes because you drink a wine and you're like this is it this is the window it couldn't be any better do you know in terms of in terms of evolution complexity freshness balance sometimes you just open a wine and it's so perfect that it's sad because you open that wine in a year's time and you're not going to get that same experience. And for me, um, and this is a really good springboard into the next Cabernet we're going to look at, but for me, this this 15 Reserve Chardonnay and the Stevens Road, but but um, to my heart yesterday and, and today, that 15 Reserve Chardonnay is just exactly perfect. It's where I want to see it and I'm mm. so sad about that because... Oh, it's in a, yeah, you're right, it's in a sweet spot. So, yeah, it was really um, thrilled to see it in the context too and... And to see some of these younger wines, and while it might be sad to see that, um, you know, evolve further, but hopefully it's still got oh, plenty it's got of life. Ages to go. <laughs> still got plenty of life ahead of it. But looking forward to the, you know, like the the 19s, the 20, and the 21, and what they hopefully, you know. Mm. So there's always something nice around the corner. Totally, there is, and the next wine really illustrates that. So um, we've got the 2011 Reserve Cabernet. So this. Um, oh, Stevens Road. This one. Stevens Road. This is Stevens Road. Yeah. That's correct, because um, you may recall that James Halliday called this his um, wine of the year in 2013 when it was released. Um, what did he say about it? It smote his Venice heart like a great burgundy. 
um, fun words to say to a Cabernet producer, but you know, he's absolutely <laughs> totally right. Oh. He got it right because oh. the tannins are so fine. I mean, the fruit's beautiful mm. and it's slow and it's pure, like we know Stevens Road can do. But the tannins are the thing that made me, that absolutely floored me yesterday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he's absolutely right. Like when this was a young wine, and it's a hallmark of Stevens Road, it's generally, it's um, maybe not as blue fruited as the reserves, which is generally from further north. It's, it's more of this sort of black red fruit. Um, bay leaf and tapenade and you know classic hallmarks of and cassis obviously hallmarks of of margaret river cabernet um, but they've always got this really lovely graphite dark gravelly sort of tannin um, and um, i think that those lovely sort of um mediterranean herb sort of characters which are hallmarks of you know varietal traits of of cabernet uh, as, as something that's actually helped to pre preserve the freshness of the wine because it's just it's still got primary fruit it's sort of evolved into some of those more you know, complex sort of tobacco kind of elements, but it's unmistakably Margaret River. It's um, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, this this vineyard, um, <clears throat> when we talk about Margaret River Cabernet, um, the wines have a real propensity for um, very fine tannin and the, the best Margaret River Cabernets are incredibly powerful, very structured, but also very fine. And I often use the term weightless because they don't have that thundering baritone of evident prominent oak and they don't have over-extracted tannins. The wines are delicate, um, but age beautifully. I mean, we know that the Cabernets go for 20, 30 plus 40 years. You know, they're incredible, incredible wines. So um, this really is in its infancy still, but. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I think good. Marks has had a great, you know, it's only got a 50 plus year um, commercial wine growing history. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's, I think, not just sanitary, but hopefully, but a lot of producers are now at a point where I think we're all pretty comfortable in our skin where we've been down the path of back in the early days where basically due to bird pressure and the lack of bird nets, people were picking early and they were very much in that sort of Ribena capsicum kind of style in the in the 80s and so on. Um, and then through the evidence of sort of the late 90s where pick, people were picking really, really ripe. And as a result, there was a lot of these bigger alcohol, higher pH sort of wines. Whereas now I think people are a lot more comfortable in, in our own skin and you know, trying to relish that varietal and regional integrity and that freshness. And um, yeah, I think we've come a long way in a very short sp space of time, um, you know, and we've, we've learned along the way and um, yeah, and looked over our shoulders and see what other places around the world are doing. But I think, yeah, most people in Margaret River these days are sort of marching to their own drum beat. Absolutely, and that's, that's part of what is um, establishing a very firm and very wonderful regional style here. Mm. Um, the wines are incredible and really the only problem with the wines is people don't drink them enough. Mm. People outside of Western Australia and, and by extension Australia, you know, don't necessarily know about them, but that will change. Um, so we then move into the 2014 um, Stevens Road Reserve. 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 Uh, so 14, when 18 came around, um, just a bit of context, 18 was this super epic vintage. It was basically, I say near perfect only because I'm a little hundred point shy. I get nervous of saying it was perfect, but you know you could probably have a couple of perfect vintages in different in different ways. Eighteen was perfect, right? Pretty well perfect um, across reds and whites. Yep, no, it was a cracker. Um, just uh, fourteen was great too, to be honest. Like just even. I think yeah. that's the thing about these vintages is you don't necessarily need you know uber hot vintages, or or it's just about having the evenness and that long ripening period, not having the spikes and troughs of temperature or rain events. Um, and also just balance, like the, both of those seasons had lovely balanced crops. So weren't undercropped, weren't overcropped. Um, but when you get sort of all of the stars aligning like that, it just bodes really well. And with Cabernet and our lovely sort of uh, Mediterranean sort of maritime climate here with a long, long window of ripening um, that allows that sort of tannin resolution and the tannin ripeness, which is really important for us because none of our wines, um, uh, we don't find any of our wines and we don't add tannins. We try and make sure that we've got it right in the vineyard and then yeah, just um, are thoughtful about it during heart, during fermentation. Um, so we, even when we press these wines, we don't separate the pressings and the free one, free run. We but we don't press very hard. So we, we press very lightly, um, tasting at the juice tray and, and um, yeah, settle on the sort of tannin structure that we want. Um, it pays off. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> let no. me tell you. Um, the reason why I went on a tangent with eighteen um, is because when everyone was going on about eighteen, me included, um, still I, I do. <clears throat> it occurred to me that 14 was this 
incredibly beautiful, su- it produced wines that were incredibly beautiful, supple, pliable, attractive. It's like mm. so classically beautiful. Mm. Um, and I, I was worried that people were forgetting about 14. Um, and certainly now I think the 14 Cabernets are in this just magical sweet spot of, um, I don't know, they're very, very plump, mm. but they're balanced and and incredibly elegant. I just can't tell you enough how much I love the 14 Cabernets from Mother Uva. I think that's the, that's the key. That they've got that density but and that plushness, but they're not overblown. And they're in it, they're at, at that age now where they're really starting to hit their straps. And the and some of those sort of bottled characters are re, bottled age characters. Are, you know, you've still got primary fruit, but you've got that lovely mellowing and that complexity. That's mm. that's um, yeah, really starting to show through in the fourteen. Um, in both of these wines, both of the reserves, um, as I mentioned before, we're not wedded to any single vineyard. Although the reserve Chardonnay is always lagging us eight. Um, these are from growers uh, in Willie Abra, and Treaton and Rosa, um, Walcliffe, so um, Victory Point, Timber Creek and Rosa Park. Uh, and also with the reserves, we tend to use a little bit of Malbec and Petit Verdot. So it's just like having a little spice rack in the, in the, you know, Cabernet still needs to be the loudest horse in the glass, but having um, those other two varieties has is, is always been a, um, and since 2011 has been a staple of our reserve sort of style. Those, I, I think, from when looking at the wines yesterday, um, I certainly think that the addition of, or the inclusion, sorry, of those mm. varieties really does affect the way that the wine, it impacts the way that the wine ages because they, in terms of the texture on release, mm. the Reserve Cabernets for me, as compared to the Stevens Cabernet on release, um, are very, very tightly knit, um, very powerful, mm. kind of like the Chardonnay actually, in <laughs> terms of like density and power. Um, um, but the wines really held, I, I found, I kept commenting on it in my tasting notes yesterday, beetroot, bloodroot, which is a native West Australian um, um, uh, flora, it's a plant, mm-hmm. uh, it's root, it's quite cool, spicy and mm-hmm. bloody and earthy and good. Um, raspberry, raspberry compote, licorice, these characters, if you think about eating them, they all really spread their texture and their flavour in the mouth and that's really... Um, particular to the reserve wines because the Stevens are very fine and pure mm. and I went down a completely different track in terms of characters um, and their ageing and so it was awesome to see the two and really um, I wouldn't say that one was better than the other actually even though the reserve is positioned slightly higher in terms of price point than the Stevens, they're both underpriced <laughs> um, <clears throat> because they're very different and so you're just choosing a style effectively and for me both a representative of what Margaret River does so well. Mm. Um, talking about the 18, we could, I, I believe, we could have chosen three 18 Chardonnays and three 18 Cabernets. And the reason why I didn't do that, um, certainly for my three nominations, were because um, 18 at this point I think is still a little young to be drinking them, although they're perfect, you can drink them. But <clears throat> in terms of what we were able to see yesterday, 18 was very um, youthful and I think that it has it's still walking up to the window of, um, of its perfect drinking window. And so in years to come, I think that we're going to be floored by the 18 vintage because it was super strong in the whites, mm. super strong in the reds. You know, I talk about 14 in Margaret River um, and I preferred the Cabernet over the Chardonnay in 14. But here, 18, I'm not sure whether I preferred the Chardonnays or the Cabernets. And yeah, it was such a strong vintage. You know, I reckon... Um the, you know, to, to do that tasting again in years to come, or even in, in three or four years, yeah, Please, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there's a good chance that we'll be looking back on the 20s in a similar sort of fashion, because the 20s were, were, you know, amazing as well. Probably a little bit, you know, they're a bit earlier than the 18s, but um, yeah, I just think that they're, in a, they're still a bit tightly coiled at this stage, so they just need a bit more time. Let's just, we're gonna wrap up, but just let's just really quickly talk about 20, because um, <clears throat> 20, Actually, I want you to tell us about the vintage. I'll tell you about the wines. <laughs> uh, okay, well, 20, um, it was a very early vintage, but it's one of those vintages that um, you don't, at the time, you just were so busy just getting through vintage because of, you know, the unfolding pandemic throughout the, the world. It, you, you, my head was more rolling with logistics than anything else. And it's only been in recent times when you're actually releasing these wines that you actually stop and smell the roses and go, hang on, I didn't really give that vintage enough thought uh, uh, about how good that vintage was because I was... Well, we, the whole world was dealing with um, a pandemic. Other issues. Other issues. So, um, uh, yeah, 
looking back on that 2020 vintage, there's some amazing um, wines, white and red, out of the 2020 vintage. Again, it was another early vintage. Um, moderate crops, yeah, beautiful sort of long, long season, and you know, quite robust tannins. Like when you look at, one thing I found sort of yesterday, gen, as a generalization, is that I found that the stronger Cabernet vintages were the, the even years, and the stronger white vintages were the were the odd years. You know, with a few few um, outliers there, um, but some of those those uh, odd like 19 and 17 were cooler seasons, but they were much more in that sort of pretty frame with the reds in particular. Uh, whereas the eight, you know, 14, 18, 20 were quite robust and really quite. I'll say two things about that. Mm -hmm. 17 and 19 were um, presented some challenges, I would suggest, more in 17 than 19. Mm -hmm. And it really sorted the wheat from the chaff in terms of the quality wines. Yeah. Um, and I would be comfortable in suggesting that the 17 um, Cabernets from Xanadu were among the very best in the region because looking at them now as five-year-old wines, they're still very pure and fresh. And um, apart from, there are obviously a number of exceptions, but I'm finding a lot of them are starting to fragment in the fruit department now, mm -hmm. um, which I think may have been um, a, 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 a factor of um, some troubles, some climactic issues. Uh, yeah, 17 was a, was a relatively wet start to the vintage, and it was certainly a really, really late vintage. But the, the biggest issue with the 17 was that everything was so fruitful. Like there were some really, really big crops. So you had good flowering and good spring yep, yep. and then... Um, yeah, so, um, but it was very late. Everything about the season was late. So I think, you know, the people with a bit of experience could see, read the tea leaves and you know, plenty of people could see that, that we're, you know, running nearly three to four weeks behind our normal sort of phenology. So going in in December and January and putting fruit on the ground and actually dropping fruit off so that you reduce the crop load to ensure that you could get those, those. Um, so the vines are pouring everything they've got into the bunches. Exactly, that are there. yeah. So that you get this stuff right, particularly with the cabinet, particularly with the reds. You know, Chardonnay is a lot more forgiving because it ripens very early. But for a late ripening variety like cabinet, um, it absolutely paid dividends to go in and we put in some of our blocks. We put half the fruit on the ground. Um, but That's wild. <laughs> yeah, but then we experienced the April was one of the driest Aprils on record in Margaret River, and so it was just beautiful, long, cool Indian summer. And so the 17s really stand out to me in the, in the Cabernets just because they're so floral and fragrant and I've got this really, probably the finest tannins of any of these wines was this, were the 17s. That's just emery fine, um, plenty of tannin, but super duper fine, like quite different profile. Good for me because it's a birth year of my eldest boy. So I'm like, you know, obviously getting things together. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was 2020 because it was generally across the board, very low yielding. It was a warm season. Um, berries were small. I think it was a really hot summer, right? Yeah, 20 was warm for sure, and quite not too dim, not too dissimilar to 2015. Um, with, with respect to the, the the yield and really really small berries in the Chardonnay mm. in particular. Yeah. Um, although we did get a decent uh, Mary blossom that year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the reds um, generally, it's not just Margaret River Cabernet. It's you know it's Franklin River Shiraz. It's Swan Valley Grenache. You know, pick a variety, pick a region. Mm. They're tannic. The tannic is all get up, but they're also really abundantly fruited. Um, they're lush, you know, they're quite, they're opulent. And when we look at that through the context or the, through the lens of Chardonnay, the wines are um, the ones that I think really, I think the picking times really determined quality in 2020. And your 2020 Reserve and Stevens, which are just about to be released or released yep. today. Uh, yeah, today, yeah. yeah. Um, these wines are like, really abundantly fruited uh, but they have the most delicious juicy acidity mm. and if you're going to pick an early vintage to drink i would actually suggest 20 would be a great one to do it in mm. i think it's going to age beautifully given the context of other wines that we looked at but um yesterday they, they were just like irresistible in the mouth like really mm. a little bit chewy very very saturated and concentrated um, but the acid was just so <clears throat> yeah juicy they were yeah, just, awesome. they're really tangy and crunchy mm. and um you know, still very primary at the moment, yeah. but um, they've got years ahead of them. But I, I, I love them when they're really, yeah. that really sort of crunchy, youthful sort of yeah. style. Yeah. Part of the problem with the wines that Glenn and Breno make are that they are very, very delicious on release. Certainly, I would, um, you can do whatever you like with wines because that's the beauty of wine. Um, drink the Cabernets whenever. I find that the youth in Cabernet is like, it's bloody exciting. So, you know, if you like it, drink it. With the Chardonnays, I would actually counsel you not to drink them early. Um, you can, of course, but they just, 
they just get so much better. And so I would just start at five years and go on from there. Mm. Um, and what we were saying yesterday is the window of, of um, freshness for drinking in the Chardonnays was like six years. Mm. <laughs> there was like 12 to 18, 12 to 17 sort of period. Um, <clears throat> but I think, and this is just my external perspective looking in on what you're doing, mm -hmm. I think that um, you guys, the both of you, Glenn and Breno, both of you together, are hitting this wonderful um, harmony, which is really evident in the wines. And I think that the wines that you produce are getting better and better and better. And whether that's a function of you two knowing each other better, I mean, you know each other pretty well, but you know, like whether that's that or whether it's the vineyards getting older or you guys refining the processes in the winery, I'm not certain, but they're getting better and better and better. And I think that we're gonna see that drinking window stretch right out. Um, I think the older wines are really holding and they're really impressive. So. It was a brilliant tasting. We looked at 77 wines. Um, I'm looking forward to doing it again. We really have to look, go now, but um, thanks, Glenn. It's been a really epic 24 hours. Hi. Thank you. It's been awesome. Cheers. Okay, 29 minutes is really long, but it was really good. That was supposed to be 10. I know. <laughs>